Hi, my name's Andy Baker. Uh, I stand between you and your lunch, so I'll make this fairly quick if I can. So we are sort of looking at the other end. Everybody's been looking at the horses. We're going to look at the people who sit on top of them, if that's okay with you guys. Um, we were founded about two years ago, basically because the founder had a traumatic brain injury after a car hit him at 50 miles an hour on the back of his bike. He was wearing a helmet and the helmet then smashed into the ground and he had a major brain injury at the front of his head. What he didn't realise is that the bulk of the injury was at the rear of his skull where the brain had rebounded. Now what they wanted to do is the biggest issues with insurance and various other things that went through for the next two and a half years when he's going through recovery while he was going through recovery, he was working away at how does he monitor this better and what's a smarter way of doing it. So they've been looking at different materials, different ways of doing it and how can we integrate it into everyday helmets. What we've been doing is working on a graphene sensor that goes inside a helmet. As you can see, the graphene sensor is basically 0.25 of a micron thin. So it sits inside the EPS layer of the helmet. So when you head and the, hits the floor and the sensor, we can detect the actual level of impact you have and where you impact the head. So why is that important? Most people have asked. For the last three years, the biomechanical engineer our office has been working on with Beta and also with British Equestrian on the helmet amnesty and actually getting helmets returned that have been damaged. So as you can see here there was 189 of the 219 that reported damage to the helmet i.e. they'd had a major impact and wanted the helmet replacing. Only 139 actually had an injury and 75 of them had a head injury associated with the damage. Worryingly, as you see, 64 or 46% of the helmets showed no sign of damage at all. So people were actually going to continue riding with the helmet because it doesn't look like it's had any damage at all. So what do you really see? Well, in A, you sort of see the standard things. It looks like it's been dragged down a stable yard or kicked up and down a stable yard where either the surface has come off B, where you're looking at the internal shell. So you've, you've impacted the outside of the shell, but the real damage is on the internal side of the shell that you can't actually see. C is when you've just damaged the, mic the actual shell itself from an impact and you're not seeing any external damage. And you can sort of see the depression in D where there is an impact, but the outside shell actually returned and you couldn't see any, da any damage at all. Now for us, some helmets, we had to CAT scan. That's the only way we could get them apart to actually see the see where the damage was. But you can see in E, still seeing the same depression as you are in D, but that's the only way we could actually tell that helmet was, helmet was damaged, which was pretty important. We know this happens. You know, we don't like to think it does in the sport, but it does. So how can we make this safer? Well, we need real world data. Dropping it from three meters onto an anvil doesn't necessarily mean that. People don't do that. What we need is actual data from actual riders. And the more we can do that and we can prove the results, we can improve helmet safety. And that's what we're trying to do. So following from accidents, we're trying to look at each rider and make them aware of how often they're falling off, when they're falling off, are you falling on a particular horse? Are you falling on particular surfaces? And that's what's key to gathering all this data. So it will inform us of helmet design. We're already seeing some changes we could make to helmets now and to testing standards today. 
that's going to take us about two to three years to change any testing standards. So at the moment, we've got to work with what we have. And why should we do that? Well, ultimately, we want to, with the advances of artificial intelligence and everything else that's coming around, everybody's been mentioning these keywords today, buzzwords, big data, all these things. It's really about modeling how your brain is impacted when you fall. Now, this is not just in equestrian sports. We're looking at cycling, skiing, American football, etc. And it's taking the best of all these sports back and learning from that information and that data. So an American football, they impact sometimes 20 to 30 times over a course of a match or a game, as they call it. Um, but they've got the equivalent of a crash helmet on their head which is geared to reduce concussion, not necessarily traumatic injury. If you look at an equestrian helmet, it's good at stopping your brain or your skull cracking open. It doesn't necessarily stop concussion. So most people would like to stop concussion and the brain injury. So why aren't they designed for both? And I think that's what's going to come over the course of the next few years. So what have we done? Well, we've designed an array. You can see a little printed sensor that goes inside. That does both two things. It measures impact and fit. In American football, fit has been immensely important because you've got a player who starts a season and has his very expensive helmet fitted to him. He'll then go through pre-season and lose something like two stone in weight or gain weight, as you, if he's one of the linebackers. The problem is then his helmet doesn't fit when it actually comes to the season. So a lot of his damage is caused by having an ill-fitted helmet. So it's about how can we measure and how quickly can we measure a American football helmet fit. That technology is coming to equestrian. So we're using the same technology with the same sensor in the equestrian market. So anybody goes into a retailer, they can put their hats on and see if it fits them correctly. Now ladies, any of you ever wear your hair up when you ride? Yeah. Hair down, depends what mood you're in. Yeah. Your helmet does or doesn't fit, ladies. So you're 90% of the time wearing a helmet that doesn't fit because your hairstyle is dictating it won't fit. But you'll make it do. <laughs> and you'll get it in. Things like that do make have a massive impact on you and should you on your safety if you fall off the horse. So the black box system is designed to log every time you fall off. It's very simple. All we're doing is putting a sensor inside and on the back of the helmet is a little black box. So this is your flight recorder for your helmets. This fits on all your helmets. This comes part of it, it's free, but this fits on all your helmets. Now if you're a skier, cyclist or any other sport, it goes on that as well. So it's not just about your equestrian helmet. Now, we can see lots of different things, the magnitude, the location, everybody's talked about whether it's Bluetooth, etc., etc. As long as it's a secure mechanism between this device and where we pass it off to, that's what I'm interested to do. Because as long as your data is secure, that's all that matters. Now, if I want to share it with the Equine app or any of the other apps, I'm quite happy to do so. But where does the user want to store it? As long as you give me permission, I'll store it anywhere you want. What we've tried to do is connect this to the iOS and Android platform. Everybody understands, everybody's scared of Android because the data sharing issues are, and the open privacy issues are a little bit more flexible than the Android, uh, than the iOS. But most of the equestrian market, because ladies live for their horse, spend all their money on the horse and they'll have the cheapest phone and the cheapest this and the cheapest that that goes with it. So most of them will have Android phones. So we've got to address that market. And also what you've got is then things we can add, GPS, accelerometry. There is an accelerometer in here already, but as you can see, there's accelerometers in everything, especially on a horse. So that's what it does at the moment. Doesn't work. So the impact sensor for us, I'll do it, is just 25 sensors inside, all around the head and around the top. It collects at a certain frequency. Um, it's over 10,000 hertz. 11,000 hertz is capturing a bullet. 
to give you an idea in terms of speed. Um, and it will capture about 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. So if you're riding along at speed and you come off your horse at height, you aren't going to hit the ground at a fairly substantial speed. The fit sensor is exactly the same sensor, it's a different ink formulated, so we can me measure very, very low pressures and low tolerances. So we can just see if the fit's there. In the application, all you see is green, amber, red. It fits or it doesn't fit. And you, we set that at outset. That's what you actually see with a helmet. And that's in real time. Obviously we're doing it with cricket and other sports as well, where you've got a ball hitting a helmet at 90 miles an hour. That's the shell of the cricket helmet is titanium and metal in some cases with a very thin six millimeter EPS layer. So most of the forces are transmitted straight through the metal, straight through the EPS, straight to the head. But you haven't got a ball shaped hole in your head, which is what they're trying to stop. So in a lot of sports, you've got a lot of different things happening to protect the skull and the brain, but there's still no real world data in any of the sports. So as we gather from the health helmet safety perspective, we'll be gathering all this information together and actually advising people like the testing standards authorities on which head forms are being doing and what sizes they should be working with. And that, that's going to take time and effort. As everybody knows, changing anything in any industry takes a while. But you can only do it from the basis of having the data. So we've designed the array. It's a piece of paper if you view it. If you can draw it, we can print it. Pretty simple. So from a helmet manufacturer perspective, we're not asking them like a MIPS system to redo all the helmets, reposition, no, reinvest in new EPA layers on the basis it does X or Y. We want them to use what they've already got. And if necessarily, we're looking to retrofit some of the older lines because ladies, you feel comfortable. It's your favorite helmet. I've wore this one for the last 10 years. And when you want a new one, it's usually the old brand, the your favorite pair of slippers you go back to. So we try to make sure we can fit all these different solutions as possible. So why do we do it with the industry? Well, for us, it's really about maximizing, as I just said, their existing stock, bringing helmets into the real world. So looking at real world impacts in a digital age. <laughs> We're ensuring safety checks for the sport take place. So it's not, it's got a kite mark inside the helmet, so it's got to be safe. No, that helmet's had six impacts, all above red, that helmet should not be worn. And we can show that on the app. So anybody walks up to any competition and go, yes, my helmet's fine and it's green. Encourage replacements of helmets, increase the replacement cycle. I've seen, looking at the research I've been doing over the last year, going to stables, some helmets 10, 15, gentleman described, helmet 30 years old. You know, it's my favorite. Okay, but you know, you change a lot of your other safety features and a lot of people will not change their helmets. And allow for us to do active research. So this is gonna go into the formal research that we did with Dublin, University of Dublin. We're gonna continue with Beta, the British Equestrian and Dublin to make sure we're getting better helmets in the future. And one of the things we've seen across the world at the moment in some of our is allowing an increase in the wholesale price of helmets. We're not saying the retail price of helmets, we're saying the wholesale price. The issue in the market at the moment is not the retail price, it is the wholesales. So it's similar to if you look at the Tesco's or the major retailers in the UK saying to the milk guys, I know you're producing more milk, we want to make more margin at the retail end, you can't put up your price of your milk at the bottom end when they need to with the cost of feed and everything else goes up. It's very similar, if you, unless they can put the wholesale price up to the retailers, they won't do it and they will never invest in this technology. This allows them to get cutting edge, techn cutting edge technology into helmets, into helmets today that we can do research from and it's not significant. 
These only cost low pounds to put in, not tens of thousands of pounds or tens of pounds. Any questions, anybody? Before lunch. Hi, I'm from my lovely house, Rescue. I am just wondering that, let's say you're out and you have a fall and you need um, a response from first aiders or ambulance or whatever. Does this mean, is there, does it link to an app then that actually shows how much of an impact you're after having? So would they be able to access it straight away? Um, depends on the settings per country because certain countries you're allowed to contact emergency services and everything immediately. In other countries like the UK, you can't. So we've got two safety checks. Um, if you're out with your phone and the black box and one of them is moving, we will not contact an emergency. We can see the level of impact and we know the helmet's still walking around, we won't contact anybody. Only when you've got the fail safe of the phone is not moving and the helmet is not moving and we know you've had a large impact we will then ask you to set your emergency contact within the phone all the phones do have an emergency contact guys if you don't know you actually set into it it will automatically allow you to dial that number even when the phone is locked we will also put on the screen of the phone the impact itself so it will come up like a notification so if somebody finds you or you're on your own and they can see the time you've had the, the incident, what the level is and where you've been struck. So, which is important for the emergency services, they won't take your name and other details and anything else off you because that's, to them is not important because you might be wearing somebody else's helmet and, they, and I'm wearing Susan's helmet. Well, you're not a Susan, well, today I am. Um, the all they'll see is impact at midday on the floor at this level at this time. And that's really when we've been working with the medical industry to make sure that's right. Uh, so, um, out in the hunting field, we've been warned against wearing the likes of uh, GoPro cameras on our head. Yes. I don't know how true it is because we've been told that it affects, you know, the crumple, the way the helmets are designed to crumple. So, my question is, how flexible? is the black box and does it interfere with like the crumple zone design of helmets? Um, the answer to that question is no it doesn't. Um, it's tested in the same standards as the helmet itself. Um, the reason GoPros are it's not sort of prohibited, they're in the wrong place because you're putting them at the front of your helmet. Most of the impacts from equestrian and cycling tend to be the front of the helmet. So what you're doing is like putting a brick on top of it and then you're hitting the brick on top of the helmet. Now, it's your choice, but you know, there's been, as we all know, one major incident of that happening where the actual frame of the GoPro was such locked in below the EPS layer, and when the head impact happened, it caused a major head injury, which everybody knows worldwide. So that's the reason GoPro, it's not the GoPro itself, it's the housing of the GoPro and how you actually are fixing it to the helmet. Now, if you can affix it to the helmet so you know it will come off immediately, i.e. it's velcroed or something like that, then you should be okay. I'm not saying it's a doctor, but you should be okay. How is the black box different from that thing? It's at the rear mounted. <laughs> it's done at the rear, and it's basically velcroed. So again, it will still shock impact from a side impact, it will come off. Um, you mentioned the um, red-green system for yep. alerting with professional riders. Yes. Would there be something similar for recreational riders? So yes. they could have an alert, an email or a it's sample a, alert it, through it that say... Yeah, it's an application. Yeah, it's an application. So you have, again, we've done it for e the mass users for cycling and all of the sports. So you can log your name, all your personal details. You can put all, you know, for the people in all their horse details, not as complicated as some of you guys are doing it. Um, but your basic horse details, your stable, where you, where you ride, what all your helmets are, and then you can link all that like Strava to say, look, will I ride or do this sport at this time with this helmet? The calibration curves in our database relate to the helmet. So we'll have tested the helmet anyway and know what the calibration curves are. So we can tell you at what point you've reached 
within that calibration curve to say that helmet is now defunct. Now another thing we also measure is while the electronics are inside there and it's sitting still, it doesn't charge, we don't use the battery. Because <coughs> that's obviously it'll last about two or three months. But if you then do that, it will activate and we'll know it's a knock. So we're looking at four, so people who tend to do that, i.e. I'm really busy, I'll just throw my helmet over there. Um, especially children, that's where we're looking to measure that. Again, we go below the age of 13, so we're looking to look at all children's helmets, not just adult helmets. Because a lot and all the MIPS system only works above 13. And what people forget is you become a data adult at 13. If you didn't know, anybody didn't know that? Um, I didn't. I've got a 16 year old, he keeps trying to tell me I'm a data adult, let me have access to my applications. No. Um, when you leave the house, you can have access to the applications. But he. <coughs> We have to look at the transition up to 13 and everybody will have to be approved with a parent, a guardian, a stable owner to get access to the application. After 13, they can do what they wish. And just, um, could that... You, you ride horses and you ride a bike. Would, would you, can you take it off one helmet and put it on yes. another? Yeah. Yes. So the sensor at the moment, we're speaking to ski brands, cycling brands, American football brands, equestrian brands, are all looking to put this technology in. Uh, and over the course of the next two to three years, we'll be stating within the applications, this now will work on all these type of helmets as well. Um, yeah. another, another sport you might add to your stable, since you're in Ireland, might be hurling, which um, is very fast, has a small projectile. Um, I don't know if you thought about it, but it, there might be an area there. The, they tend to be, the yeah, helmet brands tend to do multiple sports. So a lot of the niche ones which we're looking at, which lacrosse and everything else, tend to be a derivative of another helmet rather than a specific helmet. So once we start working with the major brands, which we are, it's up to them commercially whether they think it's viable or not at that time. Um, we will see over the course of the next two, two three years. Does it come Kenny Hurley? Yeah. Um, look, we're going to go to lunch. Just like, we'll like one question. Yeah. Um, two or three we've spoke to definitely want to get the data because it becomes a black box of riding. So where you're going, what you're doing, are you safe, what horses are you riding, what you're not riding. We get 74 different data points on the rider and what they're doing and how they're riding. Now, if we, you want us to share that data, we're quite willing to, to insurance companies, or quite willing not to share that with insurance companies. And you'll make that personal choice as you go through the application. We're gonna to have to eat lunch really quickly. That's we're fine. back in here for two o'clock, uh, masterclass in laser therapy. Um, thank you very much. I'm here all day, so any questions, give me a shout. Thanks.